started Make Life Fun podcast because I needed more fun in my life. When I became a mother, I, for some reason, just put on this like high ponytail, mom jeans, and nose to the ground. I wasn't having fun. It wasn't until I started having fun that it started becoming easy. Fun and mental health go hand in hand for me. I've been in this mental health game my whole life. <laughs> and I am so lit up to like help other people. I'm so lit up for other people to experience this because it's what my wish and my mission is for every woman is to find safety within themselves because it took me a long time to get here. Hello everyone. Today will be a solo episode where I will be answering some common questions that come up in my coaching practice. Why do we as women need permission to give ourselves time and boundaries? Well, let's dive in. That's a beautiful question. When you're feeling high on life and then all of a sudden somebody comes and dumps all their problem on you. As a hairstylist, I have definitely, definitely experienced that many times because I was the one who was just always positive. And then my clients are in my chairs, woe is me. And life is horrible. Everything is horrible. And I held the space for them to acknowledge it. I held the space for them to experience what they were experiencing. But I think what really worked for me is I kept reminding myself, like, it's not my problem. (laughs) Like, that's not my problem. Like I can help you if you're asking for my help, if you want my feedback, if that's what you are looking for, I can give you some advice, but until you're ready to take it, you're not going to take it anyway. So I'm just going to listen and give you the space to vent. And hopefully by leaving my salon chair, by leaving my coaching, you have said everything you needed to say, and maybe you've moved that energy around out. And now you can hopefully be a better person for yourself and for your people. So that's the best way I know how to answer that question is all the time when somebody is like bringing us their problem, it feels like we have to help them. We have to fix it for them. And it becomes like, our problem, like both of our problems together. And what I've learned through my coaching is that it's not my problem. I can hold the space for you to say what you need to say, but until you say, I need help, do you have any suggestions? Like then I can work on it side by side with you. We can both look at your problem together and I could give you some feedback, some advice, what's worked for me. But ultimately that person has to decide they're going to either take it or not take it. And when somebody comes at you so negative, sometimes it's like, you just have to take a breath and know that it's not my problem. That's them. That's me. And that's where the the practice of presence, I believe, comes in. Because when you're present inside your body and you can come back, even when somebody is being negative, you can be like, I'm okay over here. (laughs) Like everything feels good in here. So I'm just going to like leave that person over there and try to practice that presence of being with myself instead of being all consuming on that person's negativity. Because what it is, is your thoughts create your feelings. So if you're thinking in a negative way, like we have to dissect, like what's that thought that's making you feel so negative? What's that thought that's making you beat up on yourself? And once you start exploring that thought that's causing you to not feel good, causing you to be in a negative space, then we can start to acknowledge and ask, is that thought true for that person? Is it true that your husband ruined your day? Is that true that the fact that he didn't come inside and give you that hug right away when you wanted it, that now your whole day is ruined? Like, is it true? What's causing you that negative thought? Is it really that, is it, is it really true? And what you start to realize is no, I'm giving it meaning. I'm believing this way. And my belief and my thought is causing me to be sad, to be upset, to be frustrated. And so once you start catching your thoughts, then your feelings change. And what I do with my clients is I have them try on different feelings, like try on those different feelings, try on angry, try on mad, try on frustrated, try on overwhelmed, and then try on joy and then try on peace. And like, just practice trying on different feelings so that when your feelings arise, like they become normalized, like, like you can feel them, you can acknowledge them. And then as quickly as they come, give yourself space to process it, but then let it go. Yeah, healthy boundaries is a big one and healthy boundaries has not always been easy for me because I am a recovering people pleaser. So saying yes was my normal. Saying no did not feel good. It did not feel good to say no. It felt like I was hurting that other person. It felt like it was all about the other. It was not about me when I would say yes. 
And when I said no, it was like, ooh, I can't say no. They, they need me. And so setting boundaries is so important that we have to value ourselves. We have to look within ourselves and say, I'm going to protect what I value. Like the analogy I like to give is like our family. We love our family. I love my son. I love my husband. So we're in a home that's protecting us so that from the outside environment, because we're protecting what we care about. We buy that brand new car and we love it. We put it in the garage and close the garage because we're protecting it. So we protect what we like. We protect what we love and what we care about. So why don't we do that for ourselves? Why don't we protect ourselves? Why don't we value ourselves enough to say, I matter? So I'm going to say no from a place of, I love myself and it's going to be a no for me. And what I've learned every time I've said no, it gives the other person freedom to find that person who's going to say, heck yeah, that person who is their person because they're, we all have our people. And the more I set standards, the more I set boundaries, the more of my people shows up in my world, the more the people that I want in my space show up. And when it comes to boundaries, do it, say no from a place of, I care about myself. I love myself enough to say no. We know it's a law that like attracts like, like what you focus on will always grow. If you're focused on seeing the good, you'll see the good. If you focus on seeing the bad, you'll see the bad. So it's the same thing. If you're surrounding yourself with people that are vibing higher or vibing lower than you, and you're the high viber, it just doesn't work because you're constantly going back down. You're constantly like, trying to meet them where they're at. And so I have a great story for this. My husband, when I was, when I, I'm always doing this work, this is my life's work and I love it so much. (laughs) I love keeping myself in the high vibration and catching myself when I'm not. And so my husband would say like, you're changing every day, every day you're changing and you're not the same person I married. You're not the same person I dated. And I honestly said to him, like, I'm up here now and I need you to come join me. (laughs) Like you need to rise up. You need to meet me here because it's really great here. Like, and we got to do it together because I'm never going back down there. Never. And so setting that standard, I saw him level up. My, like I was saying, and I don't know, a previous episode, my husband hasn't drank for over eight months. He is meditating. He is working on himself and showing up in his true self. And he's saying to me things like people are nicer to me. I was like, yeah, when you're happy. People want to be around that. And so when you feel good, people want to be around that. Like, especially with the way the world is right now, we need more people feeling good. Getting my husband up to my high vibe that I wanted to live in, I want to live in, I'm cultivating daily, was I just kept putting myself in that high vibe place. And he had, it was like a magnet. He had no other way to go. Like, you can't approach somebody who is vibing so high with all your negativity because you're just, I mean, it's like almost like a, it's like this bubble of like love around me. And so when the negative comes, it's like, I instantly feel it. Like, even when he is like one, like he'll he'll be talking to me and sometimes he gets in his head and he'll just like disappear. Like I, I can feel it. I can sense it. I can see it. Like it's, I, it's like an instant shift. Like, whereas before I was doing the work, I never used to notice those things. I never used to see that disconnect. I never used to see that his mind sometimes would wander off. But now I'm like, honey, like, where'd you go? (laughs) Come back, come back here, be with me here. And so it was just like, when you grow, you bring those people around you. Like that is the, that is like one of the biggest things that has happened. Asking yourself that question often, like what is the most important thing to me? Like in this moment, what is the most important thing? Those are the things that we normally don't look at. We look at all our problems. We look at all our issues. We look at the things that, our heart in our life. And if we keep focusing on that, that's all we see. And I'm going to share this because it's on my heart to share that it's literally on my heart to share that what we focus on, we grow it. So I'm a God girl. I love God. (laughs) He's my man. He's my person. And honestly, what I believe is like the whole Adam and Eve story, I think is so profound. And recently I heard it in a way that I'd never heard it before. So I'm going to share it here because it's on my heart to share it. God created this fortress of beauty with all these trees, with all these fruits, with all the things that these person, Adam and Eve, could ever want. Everything they could want. He said, there is just one that you cannot have, but you can have everything else. And what I'm imagining is like a lot of beauty, a lot of trees, a lot of amazingness, but you can't have that one. And it's in the middle. And in order to get to that one, you have to walk 
through all that beauty to find that one that you can't have. But what the Satan, the devil tempted them to do was look at that one thing they couldn't have, which was that one tree. So they had to walk through all the beautiful trees, all the beautiful fruits, everything to get to that one tree. And they made a decision to be like, that's what I don't have. So then they lost everything they had. And so if we're always focusing on the lack, if we're always focusing on the bad, the negative, we're going to lose all the good. So if we can look at the good that we have, we're just going to multiply it and it's going to be abundant. And I've never heard that story in that way. I've been going to church since I was a child. It was always like, (laughs) it was always like a tale of like, I don't even know how to put that into words. It was like almost like a shaming with that story is how I was told to me. So hearing it in that way that what you focus on is what you get. And if you focus on that lack, if you're focusing on that one thing you don't have, you're going to lose everything you have. But if you focus on that abundance of all that you have and the joy in your life, like the food on the table, the roof over your head, your eyes open today, the sun is shining, like just start just start seeing the good. You can't help but see more good. Religion, to me, when I was younger, I love my parents like I do. I love, love, love my parents. And I love that they taught us about God and they taught us that we are the creators of our reality. Like, I love that. My parents have always taught that to us. But I felt like the Bible was used almost as a weapon. (laughs) Like, do this or else do this or else. And so when you're a child, that's almost causes fear in you. And so when you misbehave, you automatically think I'm going to hell. Like it was just, I don't think it was meant to be that way, but I think that's what it was taught to them. So for me, growing up, religion was just something I had to do. It wasn't something I wanted to do. And I probably didn't pay as much attention as I should have. So now that I'm older, I it took me a long journey actually to get to this place where I Honestly, if I'm being really, really honest, it wasn't until I had my son that this relationship with religion is not so much religion. It's like, it's just me in a relationship with my creator. It's just me in a relationship with the higher power. It's just like, I had this all consuming love for my son that I've never felt before. Like it was like overwhelming, abundant of like love. Like I would do anything for this little person. And I was thinking in my mind, like if if I can love Everett this much, and I just met him, he just got put in my arms. Like, how is it that I am not loved like this? Like, I have to be loved like this. Like, I have to be, have this love out there for me somewhere. And that just shifted a whole thing for me. And ever since then, I've been on this journey of like connecting to the divine, connecting to my higher power. And when I pray now. I don't pray from a place of want. I pray from a place of like, thank you. (laughs) It could almost make me cry because it was always going to him and saying all the things I've done wrong. And like, it was always kind of a chore, honestly, if we're being honest when I prayed. And now it's from a place of like, look at what you've done for me. Look at what you've created. Look at this world that you've given me. Like, it's just a place of gratitude that I go into prayer now. And it's a whole different ball game. It's a whole different ball game. It's like a meditation. It's like a, it's like something I look forward to. It's, it just feels good. And I feel it throughout the day. And it's like, I don't have to get formal anymore. I don't, it doesn't have to be on bended knees in front of the bed. Like I was taught, like it can just be like right now. I could just say, thank you and put my hand on my heart and feel that presence. And that's what it is for me. It's like a presence. It's like a connection. It's like, it's just extraordinary. There's so much similarities because I'm highlighting the good that I learned from my parents. I am highlighting the good that I was taught by my parents. And there was so much good. Like if I look for the good, I can see it. And my parents taught us that our, like we create our realities. Like my parents taught me from such a young age that my mom had a dream of coming to America and having her house have everything in it. My dad had a dream of having his family have a better life and they made it happen. They came to the States without knowing a word of English and thrived and created something beautiful with, with the hope and the faith. Like I saw it before my eyes, their belief. Like I see it now. (laughs) I see it now that belief. And so that's the part that I'm using. That's the part that I'm choosing to share with my son. I'm choosing to share that He's the creator of his reality that his emotions matter and are valid. And 
I'm just highlighting all that goodness that I learned from my family and my parents. <laughs> and so my parenting style is like, when you ask that question of what my parenting style is, it's all the good that my parents did that got me to where I am today. Honestly, that's what I'm taking from it because they did, they did love us in their own way. They did take care of us in their own way. They created that better future for us. And they, even though they had their faults and their flaws, we all do. None of us are perfect, but there was so many good that they did. And the faith part, the belief in myself part and the belief that I can create the reality I want like I see it when I look at my brothers, when I look at my sister, like we are, we are always constantly evolving. We're constantly growing. We're constantly asking what's next. And we're constantly, so, and that's for my parents. And so my parenting style is going to be the same. I want to see him grow and I want to foster that. And I want to cheer that on. And the biggest difference is probably going to be that it's not going to be my vision for him. It's going to be his, it's going to be his vision. And I'm just going to be the highlighter, the cheerleader of what his vision is for his life. I've gotten really good at talking and him be crazy. <laughs> Forgiveness and how do we navigate it and how do we do it? That's been a journey. That was a journey that I went through myself personally. I, growing up, me and my dad did not have the best relationship. I, I think I've talked about the fact that I was in foster care and I was taken out of the home. I was in foster care and I was taken out of the home and I blamed my parents. I blamed my mom because she, I felt like allowed it. I blamed my dad because he was the cause of all my stress. He was the cause of all my problems. And so it took, it took a change of thought. It took a change of heart. It took me going on that five month sabbatical through Southeast Asia, honestly, and being completely able to just be with myself I didn't know anyone and every day was just different because I was not even gonna let my dad walk me down the aisle I wasn't gonna let him walk me down the aisle I was going to walk myself down the aisle because I in my mind I did all the work to get me to where I was like I did it and they were the problem and when I started really thinking about is that what I want for my future is that what my highest self would do is that when I look back, is that what I want to remember that I walked myself down the aisle and my dad was alive. And so I started thinking in myself to myself, like, what would it look like to forgive him? I said, walking me down the aisle would be my biggest way to my, I can prove to myself that I have that forgiveness within me. So I asked him to walk me down the aisle and he cried. He cried and got so emotional that he was going to let me, well, I was going to let him walk me down the aisle. And that day he was just beaming from that, like his, his smile could like brighten up a room because he was just so happy to do that. And that's when I truly realized that forgiveness wasn't even about him. It was all about me because the journey that I went through to forgive him was asking questions and inquiries about me. And I just thought forgiveness has like brought our relationship closer. Forgiveness has brought my relationship with my mom closer and just forgiving him. I just have noticed that it's just no more animosity. It's like, I can see it from a place of like, so different. Like he didn't, I don't think he intentionally meant to hurt us. He literally thought he was protecting us. He did what he was taught to do. It was his programming. It's what he experienced as a child. So I was just able to see all that. And I didn't see it as a victim anymore. I saw it as a this was my journey that I went on and I on the other side and now I can I can love him he is a great grandfather now and we have a great relationship now I would not be where I am today without it negative emotions are all consuming and they make you walk through your day without seeing any of the joy you walk through your day without any happiness like the negative emotions just like it's like a, a dark cloud like over your life. So yeah, it doesn't feel good. It does take a lot of energy. Yeah. So my wish has always been like on any vision board I make on any, anything I'm like visioning my future. I've always said, like, I want to become closer with my family. It's always been like a pull. It's always been like, I want that relationship with my family. I want us all healing and growing together. And so there was never, I think because I had that thought, it was never not going to happen now that I'm looking back. 
because I had the thought that I wanted us to be closer. I wanted us to work things out. And so I just kept pouring love. And for the longest time, I thought love was buying gifts. So I would just always be buying gifts. I would always be making dinners. I would always be doing the thing and just doing, doing, doing until I realized that it's not, I don't have to buy a bunch of gifts. I don't have to, it doesn't have to be that way. Like I could just love them for who they are and I could just be there. Like that's all, that's my only job is just to be there. And so I've started being there for my brothers and my sister and asking them about their day, sending them messages that I'm thinking of you. I love you. I care about you. And when they're going through hard times, I will listen and I will not try to give advice unless they're ready for it. And just being there and being that present of like love for them has made our relationship so much closer. Like they open up to me, they tell me things and I'm just so appreciative, but I think it started with that thought, like since the beginning of time, because we're all broke, like it was broken. So it was like, I want us to be closer, not just me and my siblings, but I want all of us to be closer. And I didn't know what that meant when I put that on my vision board, but I knew that it meant that I wanted us to be a family. And in my mind, a family is just somebody that you could call any time of the day somebody who has your back, somebody who just shows up. Like, I love it when they just show up at my house. Like nothing makes my heart sing more than when my mom says surprise. And I'm like, yes, like come on in. There's never a part of me that's like, no, don't come over. Don't surprise me. Like the more they come over, the hap- like the better I feel. So I've created a space where it's just an ease and it's just like love because at the end of the day, My parents did not birth us for, they had, my mom had five kids. She did not give birth to five kids to torture us. She did not give us birth to five kids to, for us not to be close, for us not to love each other, for her not to love us. And so I'm able to look at it through that lens of my parents love us. My siblings, like we love each other because we've been through it together and we're the only ones that know what we've gone through. Like I can talk about it all day long, but we lived it. So when we share the stories, it's different (laughs) and it's healing and it's cathartic for us to be able to talk about it because I can talk to anybody about my childhood and how it was hard. The only person that's truly lived it is my, my siblings. Like they sympathize with me. They know, they feel they were there. Yeah. The relationship with me and my siblings are, oh, thank you, Lord. It's, I'm so thankful for it. Oh, love language. I love that question. My sister-in-law and I were just talking about that. And she was talking about like, my love language now is quality time and gifts. And I was thinking to myself, what is my love language? Because at the beginning of time before I was this Josie that I've created today, like I thought physical touch was my love language. As I've gotten to this place where I am now, I'm learning that physical touch is not my love language. Like quality time is my love language. I thought getting the hugs and the kisses meant that somebody loved me. But honestly, that was just coming from a wounded place and it made me feel held and supported. And so when I didn't get that affection, I would get so angry and so hurt. But now that I've evolved to a different place, I'm noticing that it's like spending that quality time having like a conversation with someone, like sharing space with someone. And that is what's my love language. So I do think our love languages change as we change and develop as we develop. And I think two, based on what we're missing in our lives is what we think our love language is. So so I'm not, I didn't get love when I was a child and I didn't feel that love that I wanted to feel. So now I'm putting that all on my partner and I'm like, you got to love me in that particular way. And that's the only way I'm going to accept love. But we got to look at it from a place of like healing. Like, what is it do we truly want now? Because it, it changes as the more you do this work, the more you work on yourself, it changes. And I'm not saying that having those crutches, I mean, they serve you for the time that it's serving you, but eventually you have to start to relook at it. You have to revisit it because until she brought it up the other day, I hadn't thought about my love language. I just was like, yeah, physical touch was my love language back then. But then I started thinking, what is it today? What is it now? And now my love language is, I love the quality time, like with my partner, with my friends, with whoever I'm in sharing space with, like actually like being present with each other and having conversations that are not just how was your day, 
like the sky's blue, (laughs) having deeper conversations and actually like, how are you feeling in your body? Like what is like on your mind right now? What are you working on? What are you trying to create? Like those questions, those conversations to me are what light me up. And so that has like, yeah, so it just evolves and changes and grows. And I think you could lean into the love language you have now, but then also like maybe try on the different love languages, try on what would it feel like if I spent quality time? Does that feel just as good as getting a gift? Or what about like physical touch? Do I like this hug? Does it feel that great? Like, how does this feel? Cause I think we have all parts of us has to have a little bit of each of those love languages, like words of affirmations is my husband's. Like he loves it when I cheer him on and I love cheering him on. So it works great. But I had to try that love language on for myself because I didn't feel like I needed to be cheered on because I'm pretty good at cheering myself on now. I didn't all, I wasn't always that good, but I'm pretty good at cheering myself on. So I didn't really try, think about words of affirmation as being a love language. But then when I tried it on and I was like, I'm just going to practice like finding words of affirmations, like I'm going to feel them. I'm actually not just going to let them go in one ear and out the other, like I normally do. But when somebody says like, you're beautiful, you're a shining light, like you make my day, like I'm actually going to feel that. I'm actually going to like take it in. And when I started doing that, trying that love language on, I was like, I could, I could be that love language too, because it feels good. But before I just was looking at it in a different way of like love for me, words of affirmation went in one ear and out the other, and I couldn't take a compliment. And so trying that on, I was able to take, I'm better at taking those compliments and appreciating them and feeling them. Ah, food. Oh my gosh. So I watched this woman the other day, I was at an empowerment conference and I can't remember her name, but the name of her book is called mother hunger. And I was just so fascinated by everything she was saying. She was saying something to the effect that our relationship with food correlates with our relationship with our mothers and fathers. And she asked this question that I thought was so great. Like what the, how does food make you feel when you think of food? How does it make you feel? What are the top three things when you think of food? And for me, it was like nourishment. It was like, Oh, it tasted so good. My third thing that I thought of food, but then I started thinking of I started relating that to my family life and food. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, they do go hand in hand. And I used to use food as like back in the day, me and food did not have a healthy relationship. My gosh, I've never said this out loud. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Yeah. So back in my teenage years, when I look back now, I was the most fit I've ever been but I didn't like what I saw in the mirror and I took that out on food. So I would eat all the food and then throw it up seriously. And it wasn't, I have never said that out loud before, honestly, never said that out loud that I I did that. So my relationship with food back then was toxic. It wasn't good. I use food as a way to cope and a way to feel something. And now that I've done this work on myself, like me and food have a very healthy relationship with me. Like for the longest time I could snack for days. I could snack for days. And now I am able to say no to snacks and I'm able to fast in a healthy way. I'm able to eat in a healthy way. But when I look at my relationship with food, it definitely started out as a non-healthy relationship to now where I am, where I could be healthy with food. And I could, but also too, that food relationship shows how I am with myself, which is, wow, that's such a revelation for me. And food is not like, I don't need it. I don't need it to fulfill me. I just need it to do what it's meant to do. And wow, I've actually not thought of that before in that way. I just thought about it that way just now. I just thought about how I've healed myself and now food, I look at it so different. Like I cook myself a nice meal now. Like I would rather cook myself a nice meal than go out to eat. Like we went out to eat for my birthday and we went to a really beautiful, fancy restaurant, but I was like, it doesn't taste the same. It's not, there's no love in it. So yeah, so I would eat and eat until I was so full and so uncomfortable and so miserable. And now I eat. And I'm satisfied. I eat and I'm able to feel 
not full, but just like, I feel like taken care of in a way. And so I think food and finding your love for yourself and that compassion for yourself and finding that place of like valuing yourself. I mean, wow, they go together. Wow. Who knew? That's why the baby weight has literally just fallen off. Like I haven't done anything special. All I've been doing is working on my mental game, working on my spiritual game. And the weight has just completely like fallen off in me. And that has to be it. It's the work that you do on yourself. And then you're not going to want to put that toxic stuff in your body. Cause now you're like caring for yourself in a different way. So yeah. So my eating challenges were all because I was suffering. It was because I was hurting. I was away from my parents and my siblings in a whole new environment. And the thing I could control at the time was the fact that what I put in my mouth, mouth, I could eat whatever I wanted. And that was in my control. Everything that was going, I didn't know it then, but everything that was going on outside of me was out of my control. And so I chose food as the thing that I wanted to control. So I ate as much as I wanted, and then I would puke it up or I would take diet pills. Oh my gosh. Those were back in the days when diet pills were definitely, I don't know if they're healthy now, but they definitely were not healthy. And so I just didn't like what I saw in the mirror. I didn't like who I was. I didn't like my life. I mean, there was a point if we're getting really deep, there was a point, I didn't even see a point in living. There was a point where I was seriously like, this world is too hard. Everything is too hard. I don't love myself. In fact, I hate myself. I feel shame. I feel guilt. Oh, and it was so heavy that I took it out on my body because I didn't know what else to do. And so once I started doing the work, which has been, I feel like my whole life, I've always been trying to figure out how do I feel better? How do I feel better? What's going to make me feel better? And through that, I've been able to develop a healthier relationship with food, but even when I was quote unquote healthy, I was always on some sort of diet. I was always on some sort of, of eating healthy, going to the gym. Sometimes I go to the gym like three times a day. Like, so it was never really healthy. It was just changing. It just kept evolving. And I thought if I go to the gym three times a day, then I can eat whatever I wanted. Or if I'm on a diet, I could be on this diet for this next two weeks. And then when that diet's over, I can eat whatever I wanted. And so it was always like fluctuating. It was never consistent. And yeah, it's always, it's been a journey, but now sitting where I am, what I've learned is that if I would have worked on myself, if I would have given myself that love and compassion, if I would have looked at my problems that I had in my early childhood and given it the love and attention that it deserved, I could have been here all along where like food is used as nourishment, whereas food is used as like, it's pleasurable to eat, but not to the point of being so full. So it's, a, it's been, oh my gosh, I haven't thought of that journey ever until today. And wow. Oh, me being me now, how I would have helped younger Josie back then. I've made so many big shifts and I've learned so many things. But I think the biggest shift for me was feeling safe in my body, feeling safe, knowing that I have my own back, feeling safe in order to be messy and make mistakes, feeling safe to not be perfect all the time feeling safe to feel my emotions. Like I didn't feel, I didn't think that you could feel any other emotion than happy. I used to think that if you feel any of any other emotion other than strong and happy, there was something wrong with you. There was something wrong with you if you felt that way. What I've come to learn is all our emotions are teaching us something. All our emotions are here to serve us and help us. So if I would have known that, if I would have known that I could feel my emotions, give them the attention they deserve and then let them go. If I would have known that I could be, I could be safe in my body. I can connect to my body and learn presence in my body. That would have been a game changer. Cause I did not feel safe in my body. I was walking around in autopilot. I was walking around with shame and guilt and hurt. So I would look, go back to the younger Josie and be like, love all the parts of you. Like you're deserve to feel the way you feel right now. Like, look at what you've been through. You've been through so much. 
You've endured so much. No wonder you're frustrated. No wonder you're confused. No wonder you feel shame, feel guilt. No wonder you don't even want to live. Like that is, it's a, a lot, but feel it and know that it's okay that you feel this way. And then, but I feel like giving that attention to the feelings and not trying to push them away. My gosh, it would have changed everything for me. Every emotion is telling you something because if you're not feeling good, then it's our job to investigate that feeling. And by investigating that feeling, it starts with our thoughts. If we know that our thoughts create our feelings that we have to think like, what is that? What's that thought that I'm having that's making me feel this way? What's that belief in my tying to, to this emotion? Like if I'm feeling hurt and sad and betrayed, like, what am I believing? What's that thought that I'm having that's making me feel this way? And so I do believe every thought is teaching us something in that way, in that way that if we will only investigate that thought and give it that acknowledgement that it deserves, then we can start to change it and dismiss it and say, no, that's not how I want to feel. That's not the thought I want to have. And we then become the voice of our, we become the master, we become the voice and we take charge of our bodies. We take charge of our minds because otherwise it's whatever we've been programmed with. It's whatever we've seen. It's whatever we've been taught that's taken over our minds. And so we have to investigate that thought that's causing that feeling. And then once you've done that, then you could be like, I don't want to feel this way. So what can I think to feel better? So it's another thing. Try it on, try on a different feeling. Like, but you have to acknowledge the feeling that you're feeling first and foremost. I say it's like that little kid who's like, look at me. The little kid that's like, look at me, look at me, pay attention to me, pay attention to me. That's how our emotions are. Like if we don't pay attention to them, then they they keep coming back. Thank you so much for listening to the Make Life Fun podcast. I am so filled with joy to have you here. If this show resonates with you, I have a gift for you. If you're feeling stuck, this freebie may be just what you need. I believe that if you know your why, it helps you get unstuck quicker. So to connect with your heart and know your why and figure out what it is that is most important to you, get the freebie. It's in the show notes. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast to get notifications each week. To support the show, you're invited to leave a tip in the tip jar. Information for all this is in the show notes. Sending love and light to the spirit listening to this today. Be blessed.